We be live. Hello. Hello, Hello hi guys. I missed you guys. I miss Susie and I missed you guys. I miss Susie more, but I also miss you. Guys. <laughs> <laughs> but Damn. hi, hi. <laughs> I'm being young. Hi, hello. Yeah, but everyone. I haven't Good been morning. Live. I haven't been live for a few days. That's why I really miss our audience. I, mm -hmm. I really do. I really miss coming live with you guys. So we're going to be covering the news, guys, on uh, about religion from multiple countries around the world. Which countries are we covering today, Susie? Oh, my oh. Lord. We have the United Kingdom, India, Nigeria, Israel, and another story from the UK. And also, this episode, we're doing something a little bit special. We are mm -hmm. going to be introducing a new segment called Susie's Rants. Okay, That's so funny. I'm not going to tell you what the Susie rant is about today because you're going to have to wait until the end of the show. Mm -hmm. But I have a bone to pick with some people and I'm going to yell about some things. So I know mm -hmm. some people love to see me angry. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, now's your opportunity. Um, and after Susie rants, we have Armin wanted to do some show and tell. <laughs> Yes, I do. I do. I do. Um, <laughs> Secular Rarity. Hi, Elliot. He's saying, woo, Susie Rance. Susie Rance. Yes, yes. So after we do each segment of the news, we're going to do like next news and then next news. And then we're going to do Susie Rant. Okay. At the very end of the show, Susie will rant about something. And I think we got, I want us to do this every week. Can we have this every week? Like at the end of the show, we have one thing that you rant about. I mean, if if I find enough that fires me up, if I find enough that makes me angry, okay. yes, you know, which, you know, Armin, you just have to remind me because oftentimes when we're behind the scenes working and I need to talk to you about how I'm yes. freaking pissed about some BS, to remind me that that needs to go into the Susie rant yes. section. Like sometimes we're working together and Susie's ranting about something and I'm just sitting there and she's like talking. I'm like, this should have been on live. This should have been like <laughs> like going on and on and on. I'm like every point she's making is so good. I'm like, this should have been on live stream. This should have been like this is like it's a it's a shame that this is not being viewed by more people because it's so good. They're so good. So now we're gonna do it. We're gonna have at least some of it live on air. Yes, by the way, Rarity is saying, "Ooh, the show's gonna be juicy, y'all! Like this stream already." <laughs> yes, that is an amazing reminder that guys make sure to like the stream. It helps the channel. It's completely free. Sometimes people come mm -hmm. to us and they're like, "Why don't you guys are so good? Why don't you have more subscribers?" Blah blah blah. Well, you know what? It's because we get punished by the YouTube algorithm because we talk about naughty things that we're not supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> and you can help us fight the YouTube gods by liking the stream. So please remember to like the stream. Yes, and say like the stream. Guys, it doesn't cost you anything, and it really helps grow the channel. And tell us in the live chat like this that you have liked the stream. Thank you so much, New Day, for liking. Also, David. Um, and by the way, I am happy to tell you guys that we have been demonetized. Do you know why I'm happy to say that? I'm already. I'm, it's okay. We're fine. This, well, this stream has this stream has already been demonetized, and we don't care. I mean, I'm gonna still appeal, but we don't course. care much. We still care a little bit because we also get guys. The reason why we still care is because we also get deprioritized when we get mm -hmm. demonetized. So you need to like the stream so you could undo a little bit of that. But Susie, why? Am I not that upset about the fact that we are already got demonetized? Because we have someone in our community that is very appropriately named Angel. Because she's our angel. Yes. You know, while, yes. while the, U the YouTube algorithm Angel of Death comes to strike down our stream, yeah. <laughs> we have our Angel of Life, Angel LR. Yes. Who gave <laughs> us an amazingly generous one hundred dollar super chat? Thank you. Angel is constantly pulling out the stops. This is insane. Saying, "Let's have a good monetized stream." Well, unfortunately, we didn't give you that, but we can still have a good time. No, it's monetized. <laughs> um, We're monetized by Angel, so that's great. Yeah, 
But guys, this is a good reminder oh, about how your support keeps our show going. Because if it was not for the support of our Atheist Republic community, we wouldn't be able to continue to do this show. So you can support us with a super chat or just a like and a comment. Or if you're interested in supporting us continuously, we have a link in the PayPal description and uh, a link to our PayPal in the description where you can support us. Because um, it really does keep the show alive. And um, uh, ba, 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 ba. and we, oh, that reminds me, we actually got a few other super chats before the show even started. Vincent Sulorito said, uh, thank you for educating me, opening my mind yes. and increasing awareness of vital issues. Love and respect from South Jersey, USA. I love Ooh. vegan truckers. Well, I didn't know that vegan truckers were a community. So you just made me aware of something. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and, um, also, uh, Angel was celebrating her three month membership saying, I hope everyone is having a good day so far. I definitely am. Although oh. technically just got started. Uh, and Eric gave us another super chat saying, I'm insane demonetized when you're actually in reduced slash limited monetization might actually make it completely demonetized. Wait, no, wait, we're not back. in limited. Oh, no. Okay. So limit. Oops. Okay, so the, YouTube says limited, but everyone refers to limited as demonetized because it's like, yeah. like nothing. When they say limited, it's like really small amount of monetized. So when it's green, it's monetized. When it's uh, yellow or orange, it says limited. But it's like, for example, if you were supposed to make for every $10, you're going to make like a few cents. It's like nothing. It's basically so limited that it's, all other YouTubers I've seen, they refer to it as demonetized because it's basically, they just give it, you some, it a couple of chips. It's basically as demonetized. And also saying, saying that doesn't really, uh, YouTube is not like sensitive to the word demonetized. They're sensitive to some other for, I don't know why, what happened with today's stream. I think Hamas in the title did it. That's what it is. My guess is yeah. that Hamas in the title. Yeah. 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 Um, but thank you for the super chat from yeah. Turkey. Oh, and I also just wanted to say, as some people might have noticed the time difference, it's because of daylight savings here in America, which is a horrible system that I hate with all my heart. Um, and this might be the new time, maybe not. We're gonna, we're gonna see. Right. Um, okay, wait, let me bring up the news. Oh, guys, I have something to show at the end of the show as well, which is pretty. I mean, I think it's no, fun. no. We we, <laughs> we mentioned Armin's show and tell. Don't worry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. All right so, uh, is all news today clappable? Um, clap not all, but uh, this is. Um, the first one is okay. Yeah. Well, let's do it then. First news. First news: glorifying Hamas has consequences. UK refugee faces deportation. A disturbing case has erupted in the UK where 29 year old refugee Heba Al Hayek, who claimed asylum, saying that she was fleeing Hamas persecution in Gaza, now faces deportation after being convicted under the Terrorism Act. Just seven days after the horrific October 7th Hamas attack killed 12 hundred Israelis when fighters crossed the borders using paragliders, uh, um, Al-Hayek Al and two others displayed paraglider imagery at a pro-Palestinian protest in London. Despite acknowledging that, quote, a reasonable person would have re seen and read the paraglider images as, re as referring to glorifying the dead, uh, ha deadly Hamas assault, the judge, Tan Ikram, handed down a mere 12-month conditional discharges. And I'll explain what that means in a second. Outrageously, Ikram claimed that he decided to, quote, not to punish them as he accepted that they weren't seeking to show any support for Hamas, even though it, that is illegal under British law. Adding to the controversy, it was revealed after the, the, the sentence came down that the judge Ikram had previously, quote unquote, accidentally liked a social media pro post branding Israel a terrorist state. 
Former Home Secretary Suella Braverman blasted that, quote, with anti-Semitism at an all-time high, judges must be impartial and beyond reproach. Justice must be done, and it must also be seen to be done. The sentence must be reviewed. The Home Office is now reviewing Al Hayek's uh, refugee status, saying, quote, supporting banned terrorist groups will not be tolerated. Okay, so I need to um, I need to explain some of the details of what happened here. Okay, so this is a woman who's living in the UK and she claimed refugee asylum status because she said that she would face persecution in Gaza because of her family's criticism of Hamas. Just think about that for a second. The basis of her asylum case is that were she to be in Gaza, she would be persecuted because some of her family members have publicly criticized Hamas. So wow. keep that in mind here. Wow. Keep that in mind here. Okay, let's move forward a little bit. The October 7th attack happened in which Hamas attacked Israel by land, sea, and air. And by air, they had these freaking, you know, little dune buggies that paraglided into Israel, where then the people paragliding in, the fighters paragliding in, went on to massacre and um, sexually torment uh, civilians. And so that happened on October 7th. Seven days later, seven days later, at a pro-Palestinian uh, protest, these images came out of three women walking in the protest with images of paragliders taped to their backs. This is freaking abhorrent. And I would like to remind people, so this protest happened roughly on the 14th. I would like to remind people the Israel's response to the October 7th attack Israel's retaliation upon Hamas, the attack upon Gaza, however you want to call it, that did not begin until October 27th. So the the assault upon Gazan civilians, if that's the cause that, you know, really causes you to get fired up and your heart to bleed, understandably so, that did not even begin for another almost two weeks later, after they were had paraglider terrorist imagery on their back. Because, and, and this just reinforces my belief that if you were like marching for Palestine before Israel began their retaliation and their assault upon Hamas, then you're actually, that's actually just supporting the Hamas attack. It basically is just a celebration of the October 7th attack, and you're showing your solidarity for a terrorist attack. Because the assault upon Palestinian civilians hadn't even begun yet. So keep that in mind. So people, this video of these women walking through London with um, paraglider terrorist imagery on their backs um, went viral and all three of these women were brought up on charges and you know from you can have your own arguments from free speech perspective whatever whatever the matter the fact of the matter is is that this is not kosher so to speak under uk law so regardless of how you feel about the fact that that is an, an issue within the law, we need to put that aside for a second and say, okay, under English law, this yeah. is considered an issue. As long as it's a law, it should be applied. You could exactly. argue that it shouldn't be the law, but as long as it's a law, you should be consistent with applying it. Yeah. So they were brought up on charges uh, under the um, Terrorism Act for um, basically what, and let me find the exact phrasing. Um, but uh, displaying things that would lead a, a, a belief of a reasonable support of um, a terrorist group, some some phrase, phrasing like that. And you know what? I'm like, 
okay, regardless of how you feel about the law, if that's the law, I think that's that's a fair application of it. Because if you see that, a reasonable person would have reasonable belief that you are supporting a terrorist group, right? And, okay, no, here it is. They were on um, conditional discharges for carrying out or displaying an article to arouse reasonable suspicions that they were supporters of Hamas, which is a recognized terrorist group in the United K. And one thing that's important to notice is that basically people are really pissed that this judge did nothing to punish them. And he, the thing is, because they were given a 12-month conditional discharge, what that basically means is that they are not going to face punishment for a period of 12 months. And if they commit another offense within that period of 12 months, then they will be hit with the punishments for this. So that means that unless they commit another offense, they're walking away with no punishment. And people are pissed. And he's saying, oh, well, you know, I didn't want to punish them because I, did, I didn't think that they were seeking to show any support for Hamas. Like, how are you, are you thick? Is there any other way to interpret that? Like, I'm trying to think of, like, a different a, or a comparable example. And I, it's hard to think of one. I'm like, if if you were, I mean, as an American, of course, I think of 9-11. And I'm like, if there was some context that you were, like, walking in a protest and, like, had photographs of, like, plane hijackers on you or, like, planes hitting like the twin towers, like who, who is going to think that you mean anything different? What reasonable person is going to think that you mean anything different? And so then this became complicated by the fact that after this decision came down, it was revealed that this judge, judge, judge Ikram had According to him, accidentally, but he had liked a post on Instagram, and this was a po no, excuse me, on LinkedIn. And on in this LinkedIn post, it was by a barrister who's known for spreading conspiracy theories about October seventh, falsehood, lies, basically sp spreading um, like ideas that like. Israel wanted this to happen or like as, like basically that Israel actually orchestrated it themselves like all sorts of bullshit. And in this post by this um this barrister oh it says something really freaking horrible. Oh, let me try to find it. Um basically it okay it says okay in this post that this judge that sent sent sentenced these women it said quote free palestine to the israeli terrorists both in the united kingdom the united states and of course israel you can run you can bomb but you cannot hide justice will be coming for you israeli terrorists in the united kingdom in the united states what are you talking about You're just referring to all Israelis, aren't you? And so then it was revealed that this judge had liked that post. And then so people are like seriously questioning, like, what the hell is going on here? Like, if, like, sir, if you're a judge, you have a duty to dismiss yourself if you do not think that you are, can be impartial. That's one. Two, there are investigations that are going to be happening against this judge because of liking this post. He might be written up for, for this action because it's very important that the public believes that you are impartial, right? Um, and the issue is, is that this sentence that he gave these women um, cannot be reviewed because of under some technicality in the law. There's like some technicality where like it can be appealed, but like it only can't be re like reviewed. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. 
So separately, what is happening is that this, so the sentencing is one thing, okay? And then besides that, because of all this happening, the home office is now reviewing her case and reviewing her application for asylum. And I have no idea about any likelihood or what the status is or blah, 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 blah. But because of this, separately than the sentencing, right, because there's there's some technicality where they can't change that or can't review it, separately the home office is going, we need to do some digging into this. Like, do, is she fit to be here? Maybe the details of her, her application are actually don't have veracity. Go ahead. I, I think even if she this was not illegal in the UK, it wouldn't be against a free speech uh, laws. It, it, let's say, for example, UK had enough free speech like in the United States for you to be able to say something like this or express something like this. You can still be deported because, again, you're not a citizen. And when it comes to evaluating your asylum uh, case or your immigration case, um, your views can definitely be used against you, and that is not a violation of freedom of expression laws. You know, so even if UK, you could, you have to have certain values to be able to come to a country. That's you know, visiting and immigrating to a country is a privilege; it's not a right, and it's definitely not against your freedom of expression for you to be not welcome to a country. Because Regardless it's a of you to even be there, yeah, I agree. Because like I said yeah. before, being able to seek asylum is a human right. Being yes. granted asylum is a privilege. It's a privilege. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And in any other circumstance, <clears throat> let me be clear. This, is, this, is, this should be standard procedure. The, if you are saying that you are fleeing a group because of certain and imminent danger to your life. These are some of the criteria for seeking like political or religious persecution. I know this because I deal with asylum cases of atheists and ex-Muslims all the time. And when I'm writing to their caseworkers, I say this person has certain and imminent danger and threat to their life. Mm. And then, and you, you're saying, okay, it's coming from this source whatever that source is, whatever context. And then later you are found to be in support of and glorifying the people that you're saying are posing an imminent threat to your life. That is completely reasonable circumstances under any context to review that person's claim to asylum. Mm. Literally, that just makes sense. <laughs> like... So I want to make a few points. First of all, <clears throat> if we go back to this image here. Okay. So that's the, this is a rally, a pro-Palestinian rally. I'm just going to use this as an opportunity to make my usual point. Okay. Because this is a Palestinian flag, a pro-Palestinian rally and a celebration of civilians being murdered, you know, a celebration of an act of genocide. That's what these paraglider images are, right? And you can see once more, and in many images, the flag of Palestine right next to celebration of terrorism, right? And again, this is not just a betrayal of Israeli people. This is anti-Palestinian. This is so harmful to Palestinians. This is turning the flag of Palestine and the so-called pro-Palestinian movement into a pro-terrorism movement. And this is so harmful to the Palestinian cause. These are people who are responsible for Palestinians dying. Right? When you have turned the symbol of their state into a pro-terrorism pro pro symbol. This is why Palestinians keep dying. 
because of what you're doing. What you have turned their state to mean. Okay? And again, time and time again, I show you these examples. The, the, the Palestinian flag is now not seen as pro any group of people. To me, the Palestinian flag, thanks to these people, is now represents an anti-Jewish symbol or an anti-Israeli symbol rather than a pro group of people. Again, mm -hmm. the people who mm -hmm. call themselves pro-Palestinian are the most harmful to Palestinian people. The only people I trust to be pro-Palestinian, genuinely pro-Palestinian, are people who are also pro-Israeli. And they want the best for the people on both sides, right? Look at what they're doing to this. Look at what they're doing to the Palestinian flag. Look at this right next. These are the people who show up there. When I see a Palestinian in, in any Western country, whenever I see anywhere a Palestinian flag being, you know, waved or people holding it, I assume that under there or around there, there are pro Hamas sympathizers. That's what I first mm -hmm. thing that I assume. So the I when I see a Palestinian flag being waved around, I think that okay, these people here are probably in support of terrorism. More likely, not all of them, but more likely most of them. Or at and least... all these like leftist organizations like the PSL, BLM, like using all this pair DSA, like socialists, right? Like using the paraglider imagery, like for yeah. shame. You guys have proven yourselves to be another death cult. Right. And it was just like, oh, well, I guess I was right about you guys. I also want to mention the points that you made. Okay. So remember, Israel did not need to respond in Gaza for people to be anti-Israel and anti-Jewish people. People from very from day one. October 7th was the attack. From October 8th, people came and came out against Israel. Right after the greatest attack on Israel in its history, right after the greatest act of genocide against Jewish people since World War II, before Israel be began to respond, people came out as being anti-Israeli and anti-Jewish. So if anybody tells you anywhere that, oh, Israel is getting this hate because of what they're doing in Gaza. Tell them to shut the F up because we saw these protests against Israel before Israel responded. The anti hate, the anti Israeli stance, the, the hatred towards Israel is not because of what they're doing in Gaza, it's because they're Jews. They didn't, Gaza, the response in Gaza did not have to happen. Jews dying, people came out in celebration of that because it was given that it was this was not a response to Israel doing anything because Israel had not done anything yet after October 7th. When people came out with the waving the Palestinian flag after the October 7th, that was nothing but a celebration of Jews dying. Also, a, another good reminder for how superior. Israel is to the states that Palestinians have. When it comes to this woman was as if who's celebrating Hamas killing Jews is also herself afraid of Hamas. Right? L imagine the freedom of expression that you have in Israel compared to Gaza. Even people who are genocidal against the Jewish people are afraid of Hamas. Right? But in Israel, the best anti-Israeli government information that we could get ever is from Israel because of the freedom of media and freedom of expression. All the dirt we have against the Likud party comes from Israeli media because that's the power of freedom of expression and the freedom of media in Israel versus Gaza that even... <laughs> Yeah. Versus in Gaza, that even the people who are genocide, but imagine how genocidal do you have to be against Jewish people that you celebrate the people who you yourself are afraid of as long as they're killing Jews. 
And, oh, and, and I forgot to mention that in their court case, they legitimately tried to argue that the pal that the paraglider is not about Hamas, that it's like huh. a known cultural symbol. Oh yeah. <laughs> 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 it's just like fucking embarrassing. Culture. Like <laughs> it, it's insane. What like, culture? Do you think we're yeah the paraglide people? <laughs> the yeah. paraglide nation. It's in the Quran. Blessed be the paragliders. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I you know if like if there's a if there's like a, a sports culture around paragliding in Gaza that I'm not familiar with, like please let me know. Like you're like, oh no, actually this is a very popular competitive sport. Like, oh my god! Do you think uh, we are stupid? <laughs> like yeah. <laughs> Okay, I, I'm glad that they're this desperate to lie. This, they must be hurting. I'm glad that they're feeling the pressure to have to resort to such stupid measures. But yeah. we have a lot of super chats, guys. Thank you. Oh my god. Okay, and also wait, guys, wait until the next story because it's out of India. And I was like, is this secular India or like the Taliban? Like, what the hell? <laughs> Okay. Right. Yeah. So, okay. This next story is going to be so good, but let's go through these super chats. First of all, I wanted to read this comment. Open your mind said, I never thought that as an Iranian refugee, I would have to convince European people that grew up with in democracy that Hamas is a terrorist organization or that Islam is a bad thing. Yo, the, the, like the constant gaslighting that Iranians have to go through is crazy. Mm -hmm. It's freaking crazy. Yeah. Iranians and ex-Muslims. You guys are freaking going through it right now. Um, also, Nowruz is approaching. So I will wish you an early Nowruz Mubarak. I'm very excited. <laughs> I'm going to Nowruz market later today. Um, okay. She's more, so she's more Iranian than Mina. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> we got a super chat um, from Araxan UK. Thank you, saying, do you think that that is any relationship between Czech Republic being statistically most atheist country in Europe and a big supporter of the state of Israel? Um, I don't know about this, but off the top of my head, I'm going to say no. I don't think that. You, not that uh, I, we don't know. Yeah. No, I don't. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I don't think so. You're right. I agree with you. I agree. With also, you. I would just like to point out that there's someone in the chat called Tanky who has been consistently agreeing with me. So I think that maybe like pigs are flying right now. Uh, <laughs> I I think I think that person is sarcastically a Tanky. Uh, yeah, probably. No ruse, pure ruse. Yes. Um, <laughs> and Amit uh, Yanuka who's watching this from Israel, thank you for the shekels, saying free the Nigerian and Israeli hostages. And actually, we will be talking about the Nigerian thank hostages you. today. So it's good that you brought it up. Thank um, you. Thank you. A gave us a $10 super chat. Thank you. Very generous. And saying thanks for all that you do to educate people. Also, your lives are always best when Susanna is on. Oh, this makes me so yeah. happy. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Salvu Kumar is celebrating I mean, membership for 27 months. We love you, Salva. Thank you. And <laughs> Darko is celebrating his membership for almost two years with a paraglider imagery saying, just my culture. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. You know, I I love thinking about um, what if we lived what if we lived in a world where there actually was like a parachuting culture, like in Palestine. <laughs> Is there parachuting I mean, sports? No, not in Gaza. It's the, the worst place to be a paraglider. Is in Gaza. 
<laughs> it's like it doesn't fit that area at all. Like you can't. That's not a good hobby for that area. Um, and Salvo is saying, Armin and CEO Susie, as a senior member of Atheist Republic, I request that you do a drunk stream at 50k. Well, we will we will consider it. But that's a good reminder that you guys should make sure to subscribe because the AR militia is growing. The Atheist Republic Army is growing. Our secular movement is growing, calling out the bullshit left, right, and center. Okay? Right. So we do this every week. Well, I'm here every week. Armin does this constantly throughout the week. We have a lot of fun. So if you're here, come on. Go ahead and subscribe. Um, okay. Right. This, this okay. next story... Oh my god. Okay, okay. Clappable, right? I mean, we don't like this, but we're going to just roast some things. Okay. But it's clappable. Yeah. No one died. Okay. No one died. Next news. Next news. Weaponizing Sharia, how an Indian high court betrayed a Muslim woman. And the, the subtitle of this is going to be why we need the uniform civil code. Why the uniform civil code in India would protect Muslims. Whoa. Okay. So, and I'll explain what that means for people that don't know in a second. In an appalling violation of a Muslim woman's rights, the Allahabad High Court in India has ruled that her live-in relationship with a Hindu man constitutes an act of zina and haram, meaning fornication in sin forbidden by Islam, despite the woman being effectively abandoned by her husband, Mohsin, two years ago when he took a second wife. In India, Muslims are governed by the Muslim Personal Law, or Sharia Act, of 1937 for matters related to personal affairs like marriage, divorce, inheritance, etc. This law codified existing Sharia laws derived from Islamic texts and made them applicable to Muslims in India. Rejecting the couple's plea for protection from threats against their lives by the woman's father and relatives, the court took the audacious step of imposing an extremely regressive judgment on the woman. Justice Renu Agwar, no, no, Agawar, <laughs> Agarwal shockingly declared, quote, such a type of criminal act cannot be supported and protected by the court. Let me, let me repeat that. This is a woman living with her Hindu boyfriend, being threatened by her father and family, and the judge says to her that her act, such a type of criminal act, cannot be supported and protected by the court, and stated that the woman could potentially face prosecution herself under section 494 and 495 of the Indian Penal Code for the offenses of marrying again during her husband's lifetime, even though Mohsin had already married another woman himself. The judges arrogantly claimed that the woman is still, quote, a Muslim by religion and did not apply to convert, using it to this to deny her autonomy over her personal life after being mistreated and deserted by her birth family. This deplorable judgment brazenly weaponizes religious law as a tool of control against a woman who is a victim of abandonment both by her husband and her father. So let me back up and explain what's happening here. Okay, so this is why we need actually secular law in India. This is why we need the Uniform Civil Code. Okay, so as I explained, we have something called the personal law in India. And this is very complicated and I want to always give the uh, asterisks that I might not understand everything, that I might get some things wrong because it's very complicated and very unlike the legal system in my country that I'm used to. So, you know, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt because this is just my understanding. I'm no lawyer. So, we have different kinds of personal laws in India, and these reply, uh, apply to different religious groups. So, we have Hindu personal law, we have Muslim personal law, Parsi, Jewish, Christian, etc. Okay, Muslim personal law takes elements of Sharia law and codifies them into law in the supposedly secular state of India. 
So when you go to the civil court, the law of the land, where you're not going to a Sharia court, let me remind you, you're going to the court of the state. And when they are involved in matters such as marriage, divorce, inheritance, you can have Sharia applied to you by the court of the state of the supposedly secular state of India. So this is what's happened here. So let me provide the story of this woman. This woman is a Muslim. She married a guy. Okay. At some point, her husband abandons her. Her husband abandons her and goes to marry a second woman. Meanwhile, let's not forget that under Muslim personal law, it is only Muslims in India that are allowed to take multiple wives. Anyone else would be punished for the crime of bigamy. A Muslim woman taking a second partner in marriage would be considered the crime of bigamy. But Muslim men can legally take multiple wives, and they're the only group that can do so. That's my understanding. So he abandons her to go marry another woman. That happened two years ago. Okay, she returns home, to her family's home. When she returns to the home of her family of origin, it's, I don't know the details, but it sounds like it was abusive. So she has a live-in partner. She has a boyfriend. She never divorces her previous husband for whatever reason, but he left her. He went to go marry another woman. And she has a boyfriend. Her boyfriend is Hindu. She goes to live with her boyfriend because her family is abusive. When she goes to go live with her Hindu boyfriend, living together outside of marriage, her family, her father, begin to threaten them. They go to the court and ask the court for protection against the threats that they are facing from her father and family. The court looks at her case and basically says, you are Muslim, what you are doing is haram and against Sharia, you are the one committing crimes, and we are not going to protect you. We are not going to protect you because under Sharia, you are the one who is violating the law. Because you have essentially taken another husband, which is forbidden to you. You are the one committing zina, fornication. This is the secular court of India. And Uttar Pradesh, by the way. Uttar Pradesh is enforcing Sharia law. Holy crap. Yeah, the most anti-Islamic state in India is enforcing Islamic law, enforcing Sharia. And so this is an, a perfect example of why India would benefit from a uniform civil code. For let me explain what that means for people that don't know. There is a push within India from many parties, but most prominently the BJP, which is a Hindu nationalist party, to remove all personal laws from the books and to make a uniform civil code, basically meaning we don't have all these different privileges for different groups. We don't have different privileges for Hindus. We don't have different pri pri privileges for Muslim men, Muslim women. We don't have different privileges for Christians. We all have the same civil code. We are all equal under the law when it comes to marriage, divorce, inheritance, sometimes land rights, you know, all these things. It's uniform. We do not have all these differences. And there's tons of bullshit people that are like, oh my God, you're destroying the diversity of India. Do you think this woman here is benefiting from the diversity of India? This type of diversity should be destroyed. This type of if if by diversity you mean diversity in law, <laughs> yes, we want that type of diversity destroyed. Yeah. Thank you. Not all forms of yeah. diversity are good. 
Yeah. Diversity in disparity of treatment under the law. Oh my God. It sounds so positive. How progressive, how progressive that we are forcing a woman to have Sharia enacted upon her in a supposedly secular state. This is a perfect example of how maintaining these personal laws are. Think about this. This law is forcing her to be more religious than maybe she wants to be. This law is forcing her to be more Islamic and more observant than maybe she wants to be. That is a massive denial of her own liberty, her own freedom of conscience, her own autonomy. Because they are enforcing Sharia upon this woman because by an accident of birth, she was born into a Muslim community. And they essentially said to her, oh, well, you know, this doesn't count because you haven't applied to convert to another religion. So basically, you have to legally go convert. You know, some in certain states, you have to go file paperwork, also, all this bullshit. Is, yeah, yeah. Record, record your, your apostasy. Apo in, 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 from a religion that will want your beheading for doing so. Imagine asking that, like, oh, you want to leave Islam? Well, you have to make this publicly official. Like, yeah, that's not very safe. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you can see why somebody might not want to do that. <laughs> it's freaking ridiculous. Well, They're like, oh, yeah, you oh know, we, you never fight. You did oh, not so apply. You did not apply for a conversion. So you're considered a Muslim still. And so this, this is how you're going to be treated under the law. You have to apply oh. to be convert to another religion to face like the possibility of being treated by a different kind of personal law where maybe you would have some more freaking rights. How crazy! Also, also not that they're correct, which they're not, but not all Muslims agree that this is Sharia, that this is Islam. Maybe she wants to stay Muslim, and she doesn't think like Zena. I mean, she would be wrong, but it's her choice to me to remain a Muslim and think that this is okay. There's there's ton of Muslims that think like, oh yeah, no. People have misinterpreted Islam, and this is not according to Islam. I mean, again, they are not correct that this is this is Islam, but they have the right to think that I get to have a Hindu boyfriend and remain a Muslim, and according to what I think about Islam, this is okay. What? Who are you to tell her, like, no, if she wants to have a Hindu boyfriend, she has to officially leave Islam? Like, what the hell? No, maybe she wants. Maybe she wants to stay Muslim. Maybe she has, or maybe she's already an ex-Muslim, and she doesn't feel safe to come and announce it to the goddamn world. We don't know. But how is this your business? And again, Susie, I know you disagree with this, but how is this not apartheid? How is this not apartheid? If she, if this woman was Hindu, she would have no problem with doing any of this. But because she's Muslim, she's being treated differently. And she's having a hard time given that she is a different kind of citizen. If, if this, this is not two-tier citizenship, and if it is two-tier citizenship, how is that not apartheid? I mean, I understand your argument. I'm just hesitant to call it that because that's such like a loaded term. It is a loaded term, but it, it applies here. It mm -hmm. comes with the load. It is a loaded term, but the load is visible here. There's two-tier citizenship here. And also, I want to make another point. This is what it means to be anti-Islam and pro-Muslim. Because Islam is bad for Muslims, okay? So we are anti-Sharia, okay? But look at the victims of Sharia. The victims of Sharia are Muslim women, right? So when we say like, oh yeah, we're anti-Islam, but we're pro-Muslim, it's because of situations like this. Because when you apply Sharia, the main people that are hurt by it are Muslims themselves. Yeah. So people, uh, I'm, honestly, like people can whine and moan all they want about the BJP being the main ones to push for the UCC. And I used to be one of those people. And I, I'm just so over it. Like, you need... It, this is about something bigger than yourself and your own feelings. Right? 
it's a very self-centered like way of approaching the problem instead of being like actually how about we take a step toward removing religion from the books how about we take a step toward removing sharia from our laws how about we take a step towards equality under the law and when you put it in those terms like the people giving pushback against it it just sounds so disingenuous By the way, 300 people are watching on YouTube and 300 people are watching from Twitter, right? So all the 300 people who are watching on YouTube, make sure you like the stream right now because you don't get this type of analysis anywhere else, okay? And, and anywhere. So make sure you like the stream so more people watch this, you know? This is, I think, me and Susanna are doing a very good job and you can spend half a second liking the stream so more people end up coming mm -hmm. to the stream. By the way, we've got a lot of super chats with a lot of good comments. Yeah, let's, let's dig... Let's dig through these. Um, a couple people commented on the story first. John is saying her husband takes a second wife. She leaves and she is the criminal. What? Yeah. I'm mm. um, Leachy saying the court doesn't make the laws, though. Isn't the blame on the lawmakers. These laws on the books have are, are pre-independence. These are relics of the British Raj. So you could also make a very interesting argument that a UCC is very decolonial. Ooh, leftists love that. Let's start talking about that. Mm, how anti-colonial. But but yeah, but this shows how leftists are more pro-Islamic than anti-colonial sometimes. Because even if it's anti-colonial, if the Muslims don't like it, they're like, oh, you're oppressing Muslims. So keep the... Keep the British. We hate the British, but keep the British laws because the Muslims want it too. This, like, I don't know, their priorities doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it don't make no sense. Um, okay, A gave a super chat saying just my culture needs to be on an Atheist Republic T-shirt. That's actually a good reminder, guys, that we have merch. Link in the description. Make sure to check out our store we have lots of great shirts selva kumar just gifted five atheist republic memberships thank you selva it's very generous of you and i saw in this uh, the live chat that he said that um he gifted the memberships in uh recognition of uttar pradesh enforcing sharia <laughs> <laughs> which for those who are not like familiar with india is it's kind of like a pigs can fly situation um right. <laughs> uh Carl gave a super sticker. Thank you for the super sticker, Carl. And Gaijin American celebrating his membership, <laughs> saying, in the People's Republic of China, the only law is the people's dictatorship. Mm. <laughs> oh, the the magnanimity, you know. Um Equally bad. CDA gave a 14 Canadian dollar super chat. Thank you. Saying I'm a student at Canadian University and fellow atheist. Your streams woke me up to showing who's right. I posted that hum hummus are terrorists with hummus Hamas. I posted that Hamas are terrorists without even supporting uh Israel. Several of my friends stopped talking to me. Damn. Wow. 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 By the way, how dare you? Hamas is not terrorist. Hamas is terrorist. Okay. I know I Stop got confused the anti for a second. But no, it's, yeah, but wow, that's telling. That's telling. That is telling. Yeah. Well, you, you know, know you I think your be life is probably probably better without terrorist sympathizers in your life. <laughs> yeah, <clearly>. um, <laughs> yeah. Good point. Good job taking the garbage out. Because if that if that's how they feel about Hamas, that they stop talking to you over describing a organization that is prescribed under Canadian law as terrorists, then they probably have a lot of other ideas that are freaking sick. But if you spelled Hamas the way you did in the live chat, I don't blame your friends, okay? <laughs> like is, like, if, like if, if they thought if they thought that he was actually talking about Hamas. Yes, yes. If you were yeah, yeah, yeah. if you were disrespecting this this dish, you know, I would you know I I, I would take your friend's side. But <laughs> this is hummus, okay? So don't mistake hummus with hummus. Yeah, yeah exactly. Don't disrespect hummus like that. Um, do that. Yeah. 
Gaijin American, thank you for the super chat, saying, I don't think it's apartheid because the Muslims theoretically consented to it. Heavy on theoretically, are there Shia Sharia courts in India? I believe that there are. I believe that there are Shia Sharia courts in India. To what extent Shia practices are codified into Muslim personal law? I don't know. Hmm. Um, By the way, I, I, I criticize Israel for this as well. Israel has Sharia course, taxpayer funded Sharia course for Muslims as well. Yeah. So, Hell to the na 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 na. Um, Eric and Don't Canada. say that. We might actually get a copyright strike. Be careful. If it's too, okay, if it's too close. No, a. Yes. Sure. Come on. Uh, Eric can give us another super chat. Thank you, Eric and saying won't send when you type that with Hamas, but don't send with hummus. Oh, but you just sent Did the super both. chat with Hamas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm confused. Okay. Um oh, we got another oh, super and we chat. just wow, got another guys. Oh, on. Carl, stop. Um, <laughs> thank you for the super chat, Carl. Saying I read that Israeli police won't investigate murder cases between Arab families because they treat it as tribal blood feuds, kind of apartheid. -y. I don't know if this is true. If it is, that's a huge problem. Um, this is well for for it to be apartheid. -y, it needs to be laws on the on you know this. Not everything that is racist or wrong is apartheid. -y. For it to be apartheid, -y, okay, that's a new word. It needs to be law official laws because. If the police is be having a bias that will make it apartheid, technically most countries will be apartheid. Like, is the United like if you, if I could find examples of racism by the police in the United States, will that make the United States apartheid? No, it, they have to actually have official laws that is discriminatory because you could find bad cops or cops that are doing wrong, having bad behavior. You know, right? We have racism everywhere. Showing racism. Uh, doesn't make you an apartheid. Having official laws that has a double standard, that was that's what makes you an apartheid. And Israel doesn't have that. Right. But anyway, Eric can give us um, another super chat. Well, and also this is a problem in Jordan as well. Like I have situations oh, yeah. where I've tried to help people escape Jordan because of what I can only describe as mind, mind boggling levels of violent violence at home like the kind of violence where you like i cannot believe that humans would do this to another family member like this sorry that case still really gets me and this person i was trying to help could not go to anyone even if it could, she was already facing an issue because she was atheist and if people knew that then they wouldn't want to help her domestic violence shelters wouldn't want to help her but then even for personal people that she knew that even if they knew that she was atheist and wanted to help her, they would not do it because of the tribal violation. So dangerous. So dangerous. Um, By the way, um, Lebanon is apartheid. You know, if you want to look for apartheid, Lebanon has is apartheid against Palestinians. Yeah, that's not even a difficult argument. Um Eric sent a super chat, actually two, wait, saying the rule works like what would be shadow banned when you send it as a normal chat will get loudly rejected if you send us a super chat. Okay. Oh, and then also, or Hirschfield sent a super sticker. Wow. Thank, thank you guys you. for all the support that we're getting. Um, oh, we got, you got both of them for Eric? Yeah, was, they were like essentially the same thing. Okay, okay. Well, thank you guys. Thank you for the, uh, all the support. And also, what's the next country that we're covering? Ooh, uh, Nigeria. God. And this is not something that we can clap for. This is freaking horrific. Oh, okay. And it is not getting a lot of news coverage. Okay. Okay. All right. So, not clapping. Um, oh, next Kenny sent a super oh. chat just saying test. Test received, yeah. Kenny. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, right. Okay. So, next let's news. not clap. Next, Next news. Week. Islamist militants launch massive kidnapping of girls in northeast Nigeria. A catastrophic wave of mass kidnappings has exploded across northern Nigeria, leaving the nation reeling. 
In the town of Kiriga, Kaduna State, witnesses report the staggering abduction of over 280 elementary school children aged 8 to 15 by gunmen on motorcycles who stormed their school early Thursday morning, firing into the air. If the numbers are confirmed, that would dwarf even the notorious 2014 Chibuk kidnapping of the 276 girls by Boko Haram militants. One student was shot in the chaos and taken to a hospital with a resident telling a French reporting agency AFP that quote unquote 25 returned, but over 300 children remain missing from the Kiruga elementary and secondary schools combined. Just days prior, armed militants seized scores of young women and girls, potentially over 200, who had ventured out to collect firewood near the uh, Baban uh, Sansani uh, internally displaced persons camp in Borno State. Witnesses said that the Borno abductors were either from Boko Haram or its offshoot Islamic State in Western Africa province. ISWAP for short. With over 400 students and displaced people kidnapped, 400 students and people kidnapped in less than a week through two massive raids, Nigeria is confronting a shocking resurgence of the brazen child abduction tactics deployed by Islamist extremist groups. This horrific wave lays bare the continued insecurity despite officials' claims of improved safety after years of Boko Haram's brutal insurgency. One Kiriga resident pleaded, quote, we are begging the government. They should please help us with security as the authorities have yet to react. Um. And our lovely editor, D is bringing up a good point, saying, I've read the abductions at the internally displaced persons camp, or Boko Haram, but locals said the school abductors were bandit gangs that kidnap for ransom. So for one of the mass abductions, like, some people think that it might be Islamists, some people think that it might just be, like, gangs of kidnappers, that which is a thing in Nigeria, unfortunately. Um, but then the other one... Um, people are attributing to either Boko Haram or um, ISIS. Why is this not getting a lot more of an attention? Last time this happened, there was a huge global reaction, bring back our girls. By the way, ignoring all the boys that were killed, which was a lot of them. But why is now... Let's let's stay on that for a second. Why were the Mm -hmm. boys killed and why were the girls taken? Let's unpack that for a second for people that might not know. Well, girls are property. Why would you destroy property? They're sex slaves. Yes. I mean, not, YouTube, not by views. I'm just telling, oh my God, uh, according to them, according to their Islamic views. Why would you? It's kind of like attacking a village and killing like their sheep and donkey why would you kill their sheep and donkey when you could take the sheep and donkey so that's how they view the girls yeah and why would they murder all the boys um well because islamically the what we call boys to them are grown adults um that you could kill in battle according like after if if they if they're old enough to have pubic hair then islamically they're fair to kill you know, and also, you, you know, they're they're fighting. They're they're the enemy, right? Mm-hmm. But and did they know, kill boys this time? There are still so many yeah. details that are emerging from this. It's not entirely clear. It's not entirely right, right. clear. It seems like, it seems like this is a that that the last time that they killed all the boys was because they went to the schools. This time, mm-hmm. it seemed like they just found the girls alone. In an area. So in one mass kidnapping, it was outside of an internally displaced persons camp because over 2 million people have been internally displaced within parts of Nigeria because of all the the jihadism. Um, And then the other one that happened was an attack on an elementary school and secondary Mm -hmm. school. And um, what I learned when I was researching the story, Armin, is that, you know, many girls from the 2014 attack were recovered. They have horrific stories. Many of them were recovered, having borne many children. 
So we know what was happening to this girls. We don't have to like make any pretenses or pretend. What I learned when researching this story is that 98 of those girls were never recovered. Are still wow. held by them. 10 years. 10 years of captivity Jeez. and select slavery under Boko Haram. So to bring back our girls almost, thing. Almost a never... third, almost a third of all those girls hmm. were never recovered. And now we just had another massive mass kidnapping. How come this is not like huge news? Like guys in the live chat, how, did you guys hear about this? This is the first time I'm hearing about it. Thank you, D and Susie, to bringing us and bringing us Nigeria and also Nigeria is such an important country. Nigeria is like the leading uh, country right now when it comes to taking uh, Africa out of poverty. I imagine this: Nigeria, with such potential, is being held back from you know because of Islam. One of the most devastating thing to Africa is Islam, if not the most it's, it should be high up there i mean it's think about there. nigerian it's up there because think about nigeria nigeria has everything going for it when it comes to being the leading country that takes africa out of poverty it has the population it has the drive it has the desire for entrepreneurship right it has the population mostly right young working population that is eager to come out of poverty and it's such a huge country when it comes to population that it, if it's as it grows, it affects its neighbors. It affects the entire region. That's how important Nigeria is. Nigeria is going to be one of the most important countries in the world when it comes to, the, it, to it, it, its economic impact. You know, in the next couple of decades, you know, it's one of the most populated countries in the world, and I think it's going to go from ranking seven to fourth in the world if it keeps growing at this rate. And given the uh, low population in many advanced countries, Nigeria is going to play a huge role. And such a country with such important potential is being held back by Islam. You know, this is religion. This is the impact of religion. This is why atheist activism is so important. And a lot of people dismiss it. But the cost, people are so willing to admit the cost of other things. You know, they're not sensitive about it. You know, when it comes to the cost of, I don't know, climate change, Nobody holds back in saying that. And that's why ad activism and climate change is celebrated. When it comes to the cost of poverty, when it comes to uh, the cost of not disease, you know, when it comes to cost of not people not having access to education. And that's why people, activists in those areas are celebrated. But the cost of religion, the cost of Islam is huge here. There is not a greater barrier than Islam for Nigeria. Nigeria's potential is Nigeria is being held back mostly because of Islam. And the, the impact is so huge. The, the impact is global. It's so cost. It, is, it really is. Niger yeah. Imagine the, the number of people who are suffering. Like when, here's the thing. These 200 people are, there's nothing compared to the true cost of Islam to Nigeria. Because we pay, you know, we say people ignoring this, but even people in Nigeria, pe even people who pay attention to this, don't know that the actual cost of Nigeria from Islam is astronomically higher than these 200 girls. And you know why we don't pay attention? Because poverty is boring. Because the bigger cost of Islam is poverty. And poverty kills more than terrorism. Remember that, guys. Poverty kills more than terrorism, but terrorism is more clickable. You know, it's more, brings more engagement, gets a lot more attention. Way more than 200 people are suffering in Nigeria because of the economic cost of Islam to Nigeria. The instability, the terrorism that Islam brings to Nigeria, more than the people who die directly from the violence, it drives away investment. It drives away trade. It drives away stability, and that brings poverty, and that poverty kills more people than the victims of violence. 
the uncontrollable jihadist violence across Nigeria and the Sahel is holding back the livelihoods and prosperity of hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. Because who in their right mind would invest With that much instability, that much corruption, and that much uncertainty, that much danger. Yeah. And even, even, even without the violence, the fact that the legal system is religious, that drives away investment and trade as well. One reason why India is so motivated to bring one, you know, legal system for all the country, because that's what, that's good for business. You know, since a long time ago, right? Since the Enlightenment era, people noticed, like the Dutch. You know who the, who are the first people who noticed this? The Dutch. The Dutch noticed that if you have a law, one law for the everybody, that drives brings investment and trade, that brings economic prosperity. The Dutch were the people who noticed that, and then the English took that from the Dutch, and then we had the British Empire, right? So even without the violence. The fact that you have in in Nigeria, you have laws that are Islamic, that also drives away investment and trade. Yeah. Man, we got a lot of good super chats and comments. And Dee brought up a very good point. She was saying parents are rightfully afraid to send their girls to school. Very sad. And that's another cost. That's another incredible cost. Exactly. When huge portions of your population are not getting educated because of the threat against them. That is a, that's a generational cost. Um, so let's go into the super chats. Oh, Kenny is saying freedom and justice is good for business. Yes, it is, my friend. Yes, it is, my friend. And this is what people who are anti-money and anti-business, they don't realize that their attitude kills. Being pro-business, being pro-economy, being pro-prosperity, people think like, ew, you dirty capitalist. Well, capitalism saves lives, you freaking morons. (laughs) I have a friend who uh, lives in my city who's a giant libertarian and she's a huge fan of Armin and whenever I'm like hanging out with her and I get a text from Armin or something she's like oh my god it's my capitalist king (laughs) 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 every single time it's so funny or she's like how's my capitalist king doing (laughs) (laughs) um so Adam sent a super sticker. Thank you for the super sticker. I'm a st- sticker. Blah, blah, blah. Adam. Uh, Lebronzo from Kenya. I remember. Um, gave us six euros. Thank you. Saying, hey guys, I also love it when Susanna is present. Some, thank you. Thank you, Lebronzo. Some pro-Palestinian people argue that Israel is apartheid, quoting separate IDs in license plates. What to answer? Now, I'm not as familiar with this as Armin is. Isn't go ahead. Yeah. I'm isn't that like First a, of all, actually just go ahead. Two problems. Uh, say so-called pro-Palestinians because these people are not pro-Palestinian. We are pro-Palestinian, okay? But they're not. They're pro they're pro-terrorism. Okay. So separate IDs and license plates for who? Are you talking about Palestinians? You're talking about Palestinians relative to Israelis. How is that apartheid? They're not Israeli citizens. For you to be apartheid, you have to treat your citizens differently under the law. No country is obligated to treat its non-citizens with the same rights as its citizens. Arab Israelis are treated the same, if not better, if you want to argue that Israel is apartheid, it's apartheid against Jews because the Arabs of Israel have more freedoms than the Jews. More freedoms, not less. So the we, people, okay, so there's three areas, okay? West Bank, Israel, Gaza, okay? If people are talking about 
apartheid and they mention to Gaza, mention Gaza and West Bank, they have no idea what they're talking about. These people are not citizens of Israel. It's ridiculous to ask Israel to give them the rights that Israeli citizens are enjoying. No country is asked to do that. No, nobody asks any other any other country to give their rights that they have for their citizens to people who are not even citizens of your country. If if they're talking about the Israeli part as apartheid, well, go look at the rights and freedoms that Arab citizens of Israel enjoy compared to Jews. Tell me where the bias. Tell me where the bigotry. Tell me what the um, what, which part of it is apartheid. If they if they point to bigotry in Israel against Arabs, then tell them that oh okay, then every country is apartheid because every country has examples of bigotry in it. For it to be apartheid, you have to show me laws within Israel that treats Arabs differently than Jews. That's what you have to show me. Unless and you're it, suddenly arguing for a one state solution. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kenny gave a $5 super chat followed by another super chat saying, weird, I can't send any super chats with Hamas in it, but then other people were able to, Yeah, you know, this is why I say that the, the YouTube algorithm is the greatest of gaslighters. Um, (laughs) Abdullah Kram is, uh, gave us a $10 super chat. Thank you. Saying Turkish ex-Muslim and now Catholic Christian since October 7th. Thank you for this channel and exposing the sufferings of Muslim women. Well, thank you for your support. And Yusuf Dumfrey said that we should move on to eco-capitalism. Is this like eco-modernism? Because I have, I, 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 I'm, I, I can be very sympathetic to an eco-modernist approach. Um, I mean, regulated forms of capitalism is eco-capitalism, and also the best way to be pro the environment is to support capitalism, because the faster the economy grows, the faster it will move to a pro uh, to a post uh, fossil fuel um, economy. So the faster a country advances economically, the faster we're going to reach that era. So capitalism exactly. is good for environment. Yeah. Um, and Jesse Reinbach sent a completely incoherent super chat saying, yo, nice face, but weirdest only fans ever. P.S. Nigerians are best at Islam. Okay, bro. Wow. No, I mean, that was a compliment. He was saying we're, we're so good looking that he thought that this is only fans. That's what he was trying to say. I think. <laughs> okay, sure. Um, well, thank you. Let's clap for this next news because we're going back into lighter subjects. All right. Um, oh, this is clappable. Next news. Next news Netanyahu vows to draft ultra Orthodox Jews ignites firestorm. Tensions are flaring in Israel as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has ignited a political firestorm by vowing to end draft exemptions that have allowed ultra-Orthodox Jewish seminary students to avoid mandatory military service. With Israel mired in a bloody fifth month of the war against Hamas, Netanyahu declared, quote, we will determine goals for conscripting ultra-Orthodox people to the IDF and National Civil Service. We will also determine the ways to implement those goals. The ultra-Orthodox community views their religious studies as incompatible with service in Israel's secular military, arguing that their commitment to Torah study is crucial for preserving Jewish tradition. Demographically, the fast-growing ultra-Orthodox population, expected to reach 19% by 2035, presents challenges for integration into the military and workforce. The move responds to pressure from his defense minister, who warned that he would veto any law extending the exemptions unless a path to enlist the ultra-Orthodox was paved. However, the ultra-Orthodox parties propping up Netanyahu's narrow majority within the Knesset have historically made such exemptions a condition of their support. The issue has long been a source of friction, with secular Israelis arguing the burden of military service must be shared across society. 
but the ultra-Orthodox, who make up 13% of the population, claim their pious lifestyles clash with the military's secular environment. So there is a lot to unpack here, and I know, I think we have a lot of Israelis in the chat right now, so tell me what you guys think. But our lovely friend Rivka, who sometimes make, makes appearances on this channel, sent this to me, and she was like, hell yeah, you love to see religious privilege being struck down. So let's provide a little, Armin, do you have something to say? No, this is. I just want to say this is very surprising for uh, to me. I didn't expect Netanyahu doing anything like this ever, especially ever, but especially now that he needs mm -hmm. the right leaning parties to stay in power. Like, what the hell? Like, can you explain to me what is happening here? Because I didn't like. This is the least of times for him. Like, this doesn't seem convenient for him politically. Can somebody explain? I mean, I, I'm. This is great. I mean, I celebrate this. I love this, but. Coming from Netanyahu, this is surprising. Explain. So, okay, basically, my understanding is that previously, several years ago, there have already been two Supreme Court decisions that differential treatment for the ultra-Orthodox community in terms of mandatory conscription is unconstitutional because it is essentially discriminatory. And so they, there was already two Supreme Court decisions saying that it's unconstitutional, but there was a situation where there was supposed to be like a plan for getting the ultra-Orthodox into mandatory service. And partially because there's been so much chaos in the Knesset over the past like several years. Now, I don't even remember how many governments they've gone through in the past four years, like more than five. Absolute insanity five or six within the past two years alone. Anyways, because of all the political craziness that's been going on, this this plan to actually bring the ultra-Orthodox into the IDF and so forth and national force has kind of been like delayed or like kicked down the road, blah, blah, blah. And this is a very important point of friction in Israel because the ultra-Orthodox community um, is growing the fastest in Israel. In the past 10 years, they had growth of 30%, I believe. And this is a wider problem because 50% of ultra-Orthodox men don't work. Of the 50% that do work, I believe only 35% work full-time. They have six or seven kids while most other israeli couples have more like two and the men don't work they study torah all day and the women are the ones that work and raise the families and they're heavily reliant upon benefits from the state while because of all these conditions within their community they contribute back very little in terms of tax dollars and go ahead yeah the ultra here's the claim I, as somebody who you guys know as, as somebody that is aggressively against islam i will tell you this the women in ultra orthodox jewish families have it worse than islamic families they got the worst deal the worst deal right so in most religious conservative families right the women are supposed to cook and clean and take care of the kids and serve their husband and have sex with them whenever they want and all those patriarchic things that we know while the husband goes work all right so in liberal societies the woman gets to choose to cook and clean and take care of the kids if she wants to or she can choose to have a career if she wants to, or a mix of both, right? In conservative religious households, we understand that, nope, the women don't get to choose. They cook and clean and take care of the babies. There's no, and it, the, having a career is frowned upon, right? In ultra-Orthodox religious families, it's worse than all of this. It's worse than even religious, other religious conservative families, because the husband doesn't even work. So she, the woman takes care of the children, cooks and cleans, and also goes out to work because the husband is supposed to just stay home and read religious texts, and he's not supposed to even work. 
So she she has to do the men's job, so-called traditional men's job, and the woman's traditional woman's job. She has to do both of them with seven kids. So she gets seven kids. She has to take care of seven kids and go out and bring money to the house as well. The husband is supposed to do nothing. Just stay home or go to, I don't know, your religious institutions and just like, just read text. Just read. Uh, uh. That's all. It's no, there's no place worse other than ISIS, I guess, right? I mean, traditional families, there's no place worse than these ultra-Orthodox. I've seen them in Tel Aviv. It's crazy. It's insane. But anyways, I still don't understand it. Why Netanyahu is doing this now? Oh, okay. I don't exactly know why he's doing it now, but it is very significant that he is, I think it was in response to um, one of his defense ministers basically saying that he's going to do things in his power to like veto any further exemptions unless there is a specific important plan that is um, in, uh, constructed to actually bring in this kind of conscription, and but it is very significant considering that he relies so heavily on these ultra religious parties. But yeah. when one thing that's very interesting, so I mean, my understanding, I could be wrong, is that if there are ultra orthodox people that do want to enlist and do go join the IDF, oftentimes they face ostracization from their community. And they can be shunned by their community if they choose to serve their country. I could be wrong, but that's my understanding. And um, one of the, the problems with the bringing in this integration and conscription is that if you were to have them in the government, then they need to be in completely sex-segregated spaces so you, now you need to re redesign things so that it's sex segregated. You that you also need to make sure that they're observing Shabbat and the Sabbath, and then you also need to make sure that everything is kosher. That's probably I don't I don't know I imagine that that's not too much of an extra burden, but I think the sex segregation would probably be one of the biggest obstacles in actually bringing forward this integration into conscription. But this is like a huge issue. Imagine your country being under attack and you have like, well, if you want me to defend it, I want you to take away the girls from me and this is how my food should be prepared. Like, what the hell? Like, you guys. And have, I think, oh my God. I mean, I, when, I mean, I'm no historian, right? But my understanding is that these special exemption and privileges that they got were originally brought in to the Israeli state because like the founders of Israel needed, you know, kind of the approval and blessing of certain major rabbis to like kind of bring this forward. And they did it essentially because that they thought that it was an anachronism. And they thought that there's like, oh, we only have like 400 yeshiva students, like give them their right. thing. You know, it, this is already a dying tradition like we should preserve this dying tradition, especially in light of all you know the mm. the the universities, the, 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 this, the this the exemplary seminars like you know that were destroyed in Europe, all that history that was destroyed, that legacy that was destroyed. You know we can we can have this and like kind of give them some privileges because it's already a dying culture. Like let's try to preserve it a little bit as part of our history. I my understanding is that they did not anticipate that. They, this would grow and continue. I think that they thought it was actually going to disappear because, like, the founders of Israel were like socialist secularists. <laughs> like, um, so yeah, I'm this very is, interested to see how this goes forward. This is the this the 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 rise of ultra orthodox uh, Jewish people in Israel is a bigger threat to Israel than Hamas. Okay, because it will it's taking down what makes Israel is is destroying Israel from within. So that's an enemy from the outside. But the, all, just like wokeism for liberal countries are more dangerous because they're a big bigger threat. For, the, the threats from inside are more likely to be a threat to you than the threats from outside because they eat you from the inside. They take away the things that made your country strong. Just like wokeism is taking liberalism away 
from like making liberalism weaker in liberal countries and Western liberal countries. Ultra Orthodox Judaism is take is threatening Israel's liberalism, and Israel is a stronger country because of its liberal values, and Israel will not be able to stand strong against its enemies if it loses those values and those methods that made it such a strong country. I mean, we saw that on October 7th, Israel managed to become this week to be able for, for Hamas to be able to do something like this right after the country was turning in on itself because of its liberal values being challenged in such a way, right? So you can see, you, you're going to see more of that. The weaker Israel gets, the more easier it's going to get for its enemies to attack her. Oh. You know, your own internal religious problems is something that you need to deal with. Defend Israel secularism. But go on. So we got some comments that you highlighted that I think are good to bring up. So um, Irina is saying the nation is under attack. Torah studying won't defend the nation. And that was actually a quote of the Israeli defense minister, he said, we recognize and support support those who dedicate their life to studying Jewish holy scripture, but that without physical existence, there is no spiritual existence. And so I think people yeah, need to understand that that's the real motivation here. Okay, th um, that's a beautiful quote, but however, let me just say, as an atheist, there's no such thing as a spiritual existence, period. But yeah, go on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Armin, we know what the F he means, okay? I, I know, it. I know. I just have to say, I just have to say. Uh, Zidonit, I don't know how to pronounce this, is saying we don't have money and the reserve needs to go back home someday. This is a small country. It is. It is a small country. And um, because it's so small, you guys don't really have the luxury of a lot of conscientious objection. Um, Thank you. so let's move to the next story. Oh, some people are asking about the Pakistani student. We're going to cover this next week because it, the news about that just came out like yesterday. So we're going to definitely cover that next week. So is the next news clappable? Um, Ooh, yeah. wow. this, is big, this is a big deal. Huh? All right. And guys, after this news, we have Susie's rant. Okay, and Susie's rant, I've seen the picture that she wants me to highlight, and it's pretty oof. So we're going to go through this news, and then we're going to see what Susie's going to rant about today, okay? Oh, actually, right, so you know one thing that I want to bring up? Sorry, this is important. I just think this is good. So this woman is highlighting the cat lady is saying Zaka are volunteering though, if not through army service for the country. So for those who are not aware, Zaka is one of the forces where they try to, it, they almost do forensic work. They try to like yeah. take bodies and keep them together. And then also like do some, um, they do, a, they do a bad job. They do a bad job because of religious beliefs. They, 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 a lot of the evidence has been ruined. I oh, think no, you know, seriously? like they, yeah, because okay, th there's a risk because a lot of people want to respect the dead, and through respecting the dead, the bodies of the dead people, uh, they're not doing proper forensics. So it's very wholesome thing if you go look at it, like oh my god, like they're taking being so respectful to the fallen and to the dead, and they're treating them with this religious kind of ceremony, but. Actually, if you were, if it was being done with a non-religious way, and we didn't have so much concern from not disrespecting dead bodies, we would right now have a lot more evidence against Hamas's crimes on October seventh. So there's that. Well, I don't know. I mean, the, the amount of what they had to have to see, like the amount of trauma they must have gone through after seeing all that stuff. Yeah. I can't even I can't even comprehend like the PTSD from them trying to fulfill their duty. All right. Next news, clappable. Um yes. Okay. Next news. Next news, Muslim hate preachers banned as the UK cracks down on extremists. 
The UK is cracking down hard on Muslim hate preachers and extremists in the wake of disruptive protests amid the Israel-Hamas conflict. The government plans to bar entry to the country for individuals from Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Indonesia deemed to hold dangerous Islamist views that undermine British values. As Prime Minister Rishi Sunak declared in a stern speech, quote, we will also act to prevent people from entering this country whose aim is to undermine its values. Downing Street is concerned about the quote-unquote shocking increase in extremist activity, with ministers given broader powers to block entry to those who quote, spew hate on protests or seek to intimidate people. The crackdown follows large pro-Palestinian marches in London, where an unholy alliance between far leftist groups and Islamists was seen. The An official review warns the threat of, quote, anti-democratic far-left groups alongside that posed by Islamists must be tackled. So I uh, hope that they're actually like including some Iranian activity uh, in the midst of this because the Iranian regime is doing a boatload of work to undermine the UK and this is just like known. And so it was really weird to me to not see that included in the reporting. I'm like, the British government literally told British journalists that they should leave the country because they cannot guarantee their safety um, from them being assassinated in the freaking streets of London by Iranian operatives. If that's not f- that, like, for shame, for shame, you're telling your journalists within your borders of your pretty small country, to be honest. Um, they got to leave. They got to go to America because we don't know if you're not going to be murdered here by foreign operatives uh, who want to target you as part of transnational repression. So just please go to the U.S. because uh, they can actually like protect you over there. That's what they said to the journalists of Iran International, which is like the largest Iranian news agency outside of Iran that isn't uh, regime propaganda. Anyways, I just think that's worth highlighting. Okay, so that 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 put aside. Um, this is a big step for the UK. And what I thought was very interesting is that they are actually explicitly naming. They're actually explicitly naming that there is an alliance of the far left and Islamists. And I thought that was very interesting because like a lot of government forces like don't actually call that out don't actually name it for what it is and so apparently there's going to be some sort of report or review that is going to be conducted to examine specifically that um so that's going to be really interesting when or if more details are revealed yes Uh, i think uk should be careful not to all of a sudden arrest its own officers for committing hate crimes while banning extremists they might end up arresting themselves. We're like, oh, we're banning these extremists. Oh, like you're being hateful to these people. And then they arrest themselves. You know, it's confusing right now in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> you might actually enforce laws that the enforcement of it will be against their own laws. So I don't know. I don't know what's happening uh, in the UK these days. <laughs> you know what? You're not wrong. Oh my God. But look at these oh comments. God. So Emma has a good point. Emma is saying, what about the hate preachers already here? That's a good point. Uh, So some of them are going to get deported. Some of them are having their, yeah. um, yeah. Yeah. Also, this person, Nisar is saying, Douglas Murray will not be allowed entry, question mark, or is this only applicable to Muslims? (laughs) First of all, all, Douglas Murray is a citizen of the UK, is he not? Yeah, 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 yeah. So a Muslim tried and true died in the wool brit. Yeah, so Muslims who are citizens of the UK, they're not getting deported either. But also, Douglas, why would you be anti-Douglas Murray now, given that this news confirms that he was right? You know, at least somewhat right about all of this stuff. So I don't know why you, you right now you should be like dancing around saying I told you so. Also, I am I have a view that I wonder if it's ex- too extreme. I want to check it with you guys in the live chat. You tell me what you think, right? I think part of the, okay, this might be, 
I might be considered a bigot or hateful or I don't know what after I say this, right? Ooh, I'm but, racing oh, myself. No, no, it's not that bad. I think it's fine. But I think part of the filtering of any liberal country when they are allowing either immigrants or refugees, I mean, it is, it, I know it's not like a complete filter. Like, I'm just saying it should be one of the many other things that you should have is whoever wants to come to your country should swear or pledge or whatever uh, or testify or whatever that they support Israel's right to defend itself and they support LGBT rights. LGBT they don't rights, get to come. I get, but the Israel thing is, that's weird to me, honestly. I don't care if it's weird. It's, it's, it's a filtering. I mean, that one I, I disagree yeah. with. Why? Germany was thinking about that. Israel's, I think if you want to come to the UK or Germany or France or Canada or United States, you have to, among all the lists, I mean, when Canada for its citizenship had, like, you have to accept that a female genital mutilation is wrong. So that was something that was like randomly there. So that was good. I'm like, if you can't have that, why can't you have these other things, right? Pro LGBT, pro Israel. You have to you have to swear that you are accept these. You have to pledge that you are. You can, if you want to make it Israel less weird, you have to say you recognize every country's rights to defend itself, including Israel. Here. In, in terms of your proposed policy, here is my objection. One, you mm -hmm. are coming and you should be pledging allegiance to the country in which you are trying to nationalize, naturalize into, right? Oh, yeah, you could do that. That, yeah. that should be your utmost allegiance. Asking people to suddenly have a foreign policy in the LGBT thing, I don't have a problem with that because that would I be part of your fellow citizenry. But asking people to suddenly have a foreign policy opinion as it can, yes. that's weird to me. I don't care if it's weird. It serves a purpose. It filters extremist people out. And as long as it does that, I don't care if it's weird. If I can save my country in, by doing things that are weird, I'll do it. I know, but I think it's, it's probably effective. very inconsistently applied under the law. Are we expecting I, them to have foreign policy decisions on any other no, no I, yeah, then what the hell? I don't, I'm going to, I, I don't, here's the thing. I get to decide what, that I, it's my country, okay? I get to decide what values you should have to come here, right? You're like, oh, it's inconsistent. Why are you not asking me you about died my and made you king. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, if you but are. Daddy, the you made, of, you made you king of Canada. King George <laughs> is who you're sworn to, <laughs> sir. You are sworn to the crown. <laughs> Nobody died and made me king. People voted and made me a political representative. Okay, that's how I, as a politician, because I have, because I'm the representative of the people, I get to decide that part of our immigration policy is that you have to recognize Israel as a country. Okay, I can decide that. I can decide that, and it's an effective filtering strategy. So you might think this is like if it's biased. I get to be biased. I don't hear the thing. Me telling me asking you if you recognize South Af Africa's re um, right to exist, that doesn't filter out extremists. That's why I'm focusing on Israel. And this pro Israeli policy is saving my country of Canada or UK. Because if you are anti Israel, you are more likely to cause problem for the UK. So being pro Israel, filtering people that are anti Israel, is filtering out people who are going to be problematic to the UK. So this is a pro-UK position. This is a pro-Canada position. Anti-Israeli people are not just a danger, a threat to Israel. They're a threat, period. Anti-Israeli people are a threat, period. So if I could filter those people out, I'm saving my country. I'm, I, you know, I just, uh, I, yeah, uh, I just don't know if your policy would stand up in court. <laughs> it was already, it has already been recommended in Germany. Okay. So recommended, this makes not it, implemented. 
Not yet. Okay. But the over the the what is it called? The over what window? I forgot the Overton name. window. Overton window has already shifted by that recommendation for this to be a uh, something that we could talk about. And I want more people to talk about it so that it becomes normalized to talk about this. This is such an effective policy to have for every country. Guys, let me know. Am I being extremist? Am I like, what is that? Like, like well, let me know if you think my policy is too much. I think it's good. I like it. I understand. And also purpose, Germany would be the, just, yeah, not Germany uh, would be a good leading country. Principles or consistency or also if it's even legal. Yeah, but it, of course it's not legal. That's the point to make it legal. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> the point is to make it legal. We can change yeah, laws. Then yeah, like laws of... Gaijin American is bringing up a good point because then where does it stop? Thank you for the super chat, by the way, Gaijin saying, should I ask for a Taiwan recognition requirement? Here's where it stops. It does it filter out extremists? Okay. No, if it filters out extremists, then yes, put it in your criteria. If it doesn't, then it's useless. I'm not going to ask people if they recognize Nigeria as a country because saying, yes, I recognize Nigeria as a country is not going to filter out crazy people out of my country. But if I ask people, do you recognize Israel as a country? That's an effective question to ask. So I could filter out people who will be problematic in my country. I'm being a utilitarian here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's how policies work. If it's, yeah, like people, that's not law. Yeah, that's the whole point of talking about it. But anyway, thank you, um, Gajan, for the super chat as well. I have questions. I have, oh, and actually, hmm. uh, human non-dancer is saying happy Ramadan. Happy That's Ramadan, right. everybody. Very soon. Happy Ramadan, everyone. Operation Secularize, Secularize Ramadan, by the way. Secularize yeah. Ramadan is going... We should talk about that. My plans yeah. to secular... Just like people... Just like we secularize Christmas, we need to secularize Ramadan. Yeah, okay? but if we're secularizing Ramadan, I'm not doing the fasting. Yeah, yeah. In fact, we, make that we clear. can secularize Ramadan by by eating and drinking haram things, specifically haram, more haram things on Ramadan. Haramadan. 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 That's good. I like it. I like that. I like that. Yes. Um. Okay, so that was the end of our news segment, but now it's time for Susie Rants. Oh, my God. Susie Rants. <laughs> Uh, All right, how do we clap for this? First rant or like Susie rant like that? Yeah, let's do Susie rant. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, we can have Susie rant. Wait. Okay, Susie's rant. Is that good? Susie's <laughs> rant. Okay, so I was just talking to Armin earlier this week about something that really pissed me off. And, um, Let's and I was like, you know what? I should talk about this on the show. Yeah, bring it up, please. Can you is there any way to like make it a little bit bigger? There we go. Okay, so let me provide this little bit of context. So um there is a uh I think she's a Twitch streamer. Her name is Aristocracy, and uh she is a Canadian Jew, and she was posting about she lives in Toronto and she was posting about how some people say that I've changed since October 7th, but I need you to understand what I see when I walk down the streets. And she posted a series of these graffiti stickers that are all over her city of Toronto. And they were freaking horrible. And this specific one really, really, really pissed me off. And I need to rant, rant about it. Like this is so reprehensible. So, this is a sticker that she posted and it said, if you don't want to be quote unquote kidnapped, then get out of someone else's country. And I, I need everyone like this is so fucking reprehensible. This on so many different levels. On so many different levels. 
but I, I want to take a little, I want, I want to take an approach to this that people might not expect or, or, or maybe have thought of. And I would, I would just like to frame this in that the, the so-called pro-Palestine movement has taught me so many things. They've taught me uh, that uh, the sexual torment of women is not rape, um, that we don't believe all women. Uh, they have taught me that, um, like, oh my God. Yeah, that this is not kidnapping. A lot about conspiracies. They've uh, taught me that apparently the Uyghur genocide isn't happening, but this genocide is. Um, you know, and this this sticker here teaches me something else. This sticker teaches me that apparently it is okay to tell black and brown people to go back to their country. This teaches me that apparently it is okay to tell back black people to go back to Africa if they're Jews. It is so reprehensibly racist. If there was any other scenario where this was said to a group of people, it would be understood to be virulently racist. Not even from the perspective of like anti-Semitism per se, but from the perspective of being black, like the POC people that they put on a pedestal and like worship their own oppression and their 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 history of 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 subjugation as this this thing that always needs to be referenced back to by your own standards. This is virulently racist. Imagine if someone said to an Iraqi American. Go back to your country. You don't want to experience racism in America or whatever. Go back to Iraq. But it's okay to say that if they're Jews from Iraq. And this is completely erasing the fact that there has been an unbroken Jewish presence in the land that we call Israel since, what is it, like 12,000 BCE? Where, 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 where do the people of that ancestry go to? <laughs> go back to someone else's country? When there's been a continuous presence of Jews in this land for <laughs> time in memoriam, goddamn? <laughs> like, damn near, like, 12,000 BCE? It is... So mind meltingly racist. I can't, I can't even believe this. And so this is like when when I used to be like a militant anarchist, a militant leftist, I used to I I used to literally be a person saying from the river to the sea, like in protests that are about something completely different, not even knowing which river and which sea, right? I used to be one of those people. And what started to change my mind and pull me out of it is the longer I was in it, I would realize, because I'm just smarter than that, how many inconsistencies there are, how many hypocrisies there are, how many betrayals there are of their own so-called values, which are supposed to be the very thing that give them moral superiority and justification for the violence and intimidation and coercion that they enact. Being involved with Antifa, I know that people enact like the property damage that they do. I've witnessed it myself because they're, they believe that they are morally justified by doing so by the, the, the nature of the values that they say that they espouse for the liberation of the colonized people, for the liberation of the black and brown bodies that they want to be in defense of. But the hypocrisies, the betrayals are just so blatant that my own power of critical thinking would constantly reveal it to me. And it, it just became, it, it crumbled down. 
the behavior is reprehensible. So, once again, I learned that apparently it is okay to tell black and brown people to go go back to where you're from. Apparently that is that is that is righteous. That's decolonizing. That's post-colonial. I mean, it's it's so disgusting. So, um and it's it's like this movement of people and it's it's these leftists that show the most disgusting reprehensible behavior that i have seen online more like they're worse than hindutva they actually managed to be worse than hindutva they managed to be worse than these psychotic hindu fascists from the behavior i've seen and these are people who are probably mostly not even Palestinian exhibiting this reprehensible behavior, which turns the wider community at large against the cause for the sake that is supposed to be for these civilians that are suffering entirely against the cause altogether. Because their language and behavior and their culture of intimidation, violence, and coercion is so egregious that it makes normal people who are probably really sympathetic to the suffering that people are going through under bombardment and go, you guys behave really weird. You guys behave very toxic. You guys behave very ugly. I don't want to be a part of that. I don't want to touch that. I don't want to get involved with that. So they don't, they don't get involved in the cause altogether. This is like the toxicity of vegan activists and how they've probably done more harm for the cause of animal rights than good. Because they're so toxic that it makes people go, oh, well, I don't want to exhibit that kind of behavior altogether, so I'm just not going to get involved. Even when they could have contributed a little bit that would have made a difference, that would have been positive, that would have had a butterfly effect into something good that could have actually been for the betterment of some creatures experiencing pain. But instead we get this. Who is this helping? How is this helping a little girl that just had her legs blown off? So, yeah, that was that was the end of my rant. <laughs> yes, it was really, really good. I'm glad you made those points. I just want to highlight a couple of things. Okay, I just want to add that, you know how you mentioned, we will, it's really good that you compare that to how disgusting it is for you to tell people to go back home just simply because of being a different ethnicity and stuff, right? If it's because of that. But this is far worse than just asking people to go back. Uh, this is like you're saying you can kidnap them. Imagine like black Americans, right? Being violence was being inflicted upon them or people were kidnapping them. And then like, well, if you don't like that to happen to you, go back to Africa. Like it's not just telling them to go back to Africa. It's also telling them that what's that level of violence is justified to happen to them because they're not back home that would be the equivalent version of it right also when they say go back uh, get out of someone else's country which country are you talking about i mean do these people understand what countries even are we're talking about the nation state the only people that have a country in that region are the israeli citizens the arab jewish and everyone else uh, Israeli citizen that ex that lives there, they have a country. This is there is no Palestinian Palestinian country. That's the pro that's the thing that you guys don't realize. This is why we are actually the pro Palestinian people, because we want there to be a Palestinian country. These people don't reckon. That's why we're fighting for it. We want there to be an Israel and a Palestine. There has never been a country of Palestine. 
Never has there been. Every time we say that, they're like, oh, look, I have a map that says Palestine on it. Yeah, it's a name of a location given by the... Just because it's a name of the location, it doesn't mean it was a country. And it's a Roman name. It's not even an Arabic name. That's why it has Palestine, and they can't say it. They say Fel Palestine because they don't have pe the pe sound in Arabic. Imagine, imagine saying that, oh, this is an Arabic country called Palestine when they don't even have the pe sound in Arabic. It's a Roman got them name. This was never an Arab country. An Arab country never existed in this region. However, the United Nations was trying to give them a country and you, because of the anti-Jewish hatred, they refused it because it was all or nothing. So if you want a country there, then make peace with Israel. After 40 years, you still haven't realized that the reason why you don't have a country is because of your anti-Jewish hatred. From day one, and you still haven't given up. Also, many of these Jews that lived there, they did come from other countries. But guess why they left those other countries? Mm -hmm. Because they were Arab and Islamic countries that they were kicked out of. You idiots think all of the Jews of Israel came from Europe. But here's the thing. Even the ones that came from Europe, they had every right to. Because they were being hunted there, there as well. But what you don't realize is that around half of the Jews in Israel come from the Middle East. And they were forced to leave their countries because, of, because they were kicked out by the Islamic and Arab countries that they lived in. They were forced to come to Israel. That's another and thing. It's they so don't ironic because these, these are the same lefty types that are obsessed with the representation of minorities. They are obsessed over the erasure of POC, people of color, black and brown bodies, all this loaded language that they use. They're obsessed with it. But they do nothing but erase the entire lineage and the lived experience that they worship so much of all of the Mizraim of Israel, which is half the goddamn country. We'll have um, half of the Jewish. Yeah. If you, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, that, that was, was my good. rant for the day. I needed to Guys, get that off my chest. Leave it. First of all, make sure you like the stream right now. And also, after the stream is over, if you want Susie to have a rant on, on, on other streams, tell her, tell her in the live, in the comment section that you are a fan of Susie's rant. So that we continue this segment, okay? Because we, after the news, um, we want to have a rant from Susie every time. We have a couple super chats before we go to Armin's show and tell. Yes. yes Angel gave another $50 super chat in celebration of my Susie rant. Well, Angel, I hope it lived up to your expectations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> super generous. Um, Sherop gave us a super sticker. Thank you very much. And A gave a $10 super chat saying, I wonder if the idiots posting those posters think Native Americans should kidnap Americans and murder them until they leave. Never mind that Jews are the real indigenous people. Let me tell you something. Some of these people do think that. And people are like, oh, Susanna, you're exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating over just talking about the attitudes that I have witnessed and personally experienced firsthand being involved in these kinds of communities. Some people genuinely want the full abolition of all in North America and believe that indigenous peoples are fully morally correct in using incredibly violent means to do so. And this is why they're totally okay with the barbaric violence of October 7th, because they say, to quote, what did you think decolonization looked like? So I'm just going to let that sit for a second. Gaijin American gave a super chat. Thank you, my friend, saying I left less leftism when I couldn't get a straight answer on whether or not they supported commie struggle sessions as an answer to cancel culture. I know. And 
that's actually something that really bothered me when I was involved with these groups is like I actually took a course in high school on modern Chinese history and we learned about all of the twisted things that happened in China, the cultural revolution, the purges, the communist revolution, all these things. And that was always sitting in the back of my mind when these people were talking about how more humane communism is. There was like, I wait, I know history, like I know better. And I would ask them questions about these things and I could never get good answers. And I was sitting there thinking, I was like, wow, if I was someone who came from these countries, like I would be so upset over how they're completely unable to acknowledge the suffering <laughs> like and the, the detriment to my culture or whatever, my country that happened because of these kinds of attitudes, these practices, etc. Um, and here's the thing you can, you can leave these groups, but you know, still, I mean, Gaijin is still like, has a lot of criticisms of capitalism and kinds of many of Armin's free market things. And, you know, they, you don't have to, you don't have to be this freaking sick <laughs> to want better economic policies. <laughs> um, Erican gave a super chat saying we should alternate between Armin Rant and Susanna Rant. That might be a good idea. And EF gave a 30 shekel super sticker. Thank you, EF. And oh my God, you no, highlighted a. Go ahead. No, I mean, you get me mo uh, my rants most of the week. So this time That's true. we get Susie. We get Susie once a week. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing live. Yeah, you're like, let me step aside. Um, <laughs> and bonernisms. <laughs> Just became a new member. Thank you for becoming a member and supporting the channel. Welcome to Satan's Minions. Um, but uh, yeah, well, we don't have an Armin rant, but we have an Armin show and tell. Yeah, but let me just highlight all the people who were just like were celebrating Aww. your rants. I just want to quickly highlight everybody. People like well, not I mean I couldn't highlight everybody, but as many as I could. I just wanted to star all of them. Yes. Oh, and we got another super chat. Oh, love the rant. Oh, unicorn, oh. my friend. How are you? Saying thanks, Suze and Armin. Well, thank you. Thank I appreciate you. that. Thank you. Okay. All right. So I have something to show. So I need to give you some context. <laughs> 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 she was like, Susie was not sure if this is a good idea. All right, so, <laughs> so context. If you know how I say in Iran, there when I lived in Iran, anti-Arab racism was a big deal, especially because a lot of Iranians are against Islam and they blame the Arab invasion for, you know, destroying the Persian Empire and making Iran Islamic and all. And there's a lot of anti-Arab hatred in Iran. However, I'm happy to say that in the past couple of decades, that has died down a lot. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, okay? I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but there is, uh, but it has reduced significantly, right? And I also like the fact that we, Susie, come back. I want you to be here when I show this. Susie, come back. Um, I also want to mention that we are the Atheist Republic. So if you guys don't know, Atheist Republic has an English channel and a Persian channel. The Persian channel is called Jumhuriya Bihudayan. And on our Persian channel, which has mostly, most of its audience are from Iran, um, we have been very successful in convincing a lot of anti-Islamic Iranians to not be anti-Arab. Uh, we One of the most successful ways that we have done so is by introducing to Arab atheists who are also against Islam. And a lot of people in Iran were, a lot of our audience were shocked to see people being Arab and anti-Islam at the same time. And like it, a lot of them were convinced by our arguments. And I, I was proud of our activism, right? However, last night on Atheist Republic's Persian Discord uh, server, uh, we were talking with some of the people there. And there's a girl there. Um, and she was uh, talking and she was displaying some still, you know, negative thoughts about Arabs, even though she's trying to um, move past that. And I, I could see that. She's effort. trying. But 
she's trying her best. It's like it's a it's a it's, a, it's, a, it's hard work, okay? And people are, and I know that the, she loves cats obsessed with cats okay and i was trying to come up with a fun way to try to ha reduce her hatred for arabs right again i don't want to put words in her mouth she would probably argue that she doesn't hate arabs but okay but anyways i was trying to help her move past her anti-arab hatred and i thought like hmm she loves cats what about arab cats and I went to AI to make some Arab cats and they were just so good. And I just like, I just want to show three of them that I made with AI, three Arab cats. Okay. So yeah, this is just fun guys. This, I'm just having fun. Okay. So, so I'm going to go, I just have three versions. Okay. This so is, this so is the first one I can, <laughs> I know I can. <laughs> This is the first one I came up with and it did have a huge, I, I, I want to report that this had these three pictures that I made had a huge positive impact on her. Right. Okay? So she, I was seeing the hatred being reduced as I kept on sending her these pictures. She was like loving them and she thought like they were so adorable. So this is the first Arab cat I made. Okay. <laughs> and then I made another one. All right. So this is a cute Arab uh, cat. The like, cat is so adorable. I, she loved this one as well. <laughs> I love how you're like, All right. and it was effective. Yeah, it was very effective. I was like, I was like, wow, I'm like doing great work here, right? Fighting racism with cats. Yeah, and guys, then you thought, thought anti-racist activism looked like the work of <laughs> Ibram X. Kendi? No, this is the real anti-racist activism. This is. This is how it's done. This is how it's done. And the last one is the best one, right? Because I wanted to make an Arab sultan, right? Mm. In her in his harem, right? In his harem, right? And then I made this. Look at this. This is a cute little sultan. This is a cute, adorable little sultan. And these are his wives. This is his harem. Isn't that cute? <laughs> The cutest little sultan out there. <laughs> Look at these other Arab female cats. Huh? Looks so <laughs> regal. <laughs> Look at them. Look at them. So cute. This <laughs> is <just> freaking unhinged. <laughs> okay. Oh my god. I just had to share that with you guys. Yeah, the, that's, that, that was this week's Armin show and tell. <laughs> yeah. All right. Did you guys like that? Okay. <laughs> let, me know, let me know if you want me to do more show and tells in the future. <laughs> All right. Okay. So there's that. <laughs> guys, so, make sure. You're so excited to show that too. I was like, so excited. You're so I was like, excited. <laughs> And it was for it's cute and it was for a good cause. Okay. Um, guys, make sure you like the stream, every single one of you. Okay, we need your likes to grow this channel, and I need you guys to make sure after the stream is over to leave a comment under the show because that helps us grow the channel. Make sure you're subscribed, but that's not enough. Because if you're subscribed, sometimes when we go live, YouTube doesn't tell you. So you have to make sure you also hit the bell notification and select all when you. So make sure you do that. And another, these are all free ways that you could um, use to help our channel. It doesn't cost you a single cent, and it really helps us. One of the most effective free ways for you to help our channel is to go tell your friends and your enemies to come and subscribe to our channel, okay? Especially your enemies. Go tell them. Word of mouth is the best way of advertising. What? Um, there was a super chat we almost didn't read. Oh, let's do it. Thank you for the reminder. Trells gave us a super chat. Thank you, Trells, my friend, saying now that Sweden is in NATO, Scandinavia is formally aligned mi militarily for the first time in 500 years. Say it with me for the alliance. What? That's right. Fantastic. Hashtag NATO expansionism. The forces of liberalism unite. We're coming for you. We're coming for your backwards ideas. Because we need to tell Russia, Bafo, fuck around and find out. 
Oh yeah, everyone's giving salutes in live chat. <laughs> yes, that we need a we need a Middle Eastern NATO. We need a Middle Eastern version of NATO. That's what we need. <clears throat> I mean, that's there. Just have everyone there. just have the whole world join NATO, and then no one else can attack anyone else. <laughs> yes, yes, everybody join NATO. Everybody join. That's 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 that's, that, that's how the that's how NATO we get maximalism. <laughs> Yeah, NATO maximalism. That's how, <laughs> that would that would generally. This is how we're uh, gonna achieve world peace. Yeah, somebody. No, it's not Ma too. It's Middle East too, so that we could call it Me Too. That's what we should do. <laughs> so NATO M E T O, then will be Me Too. Okay, so the Middle Eastern version of NATO would be Me Too. <laughs> All right. All right, guys, we're going to head out. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for liking and thank you for supporting the show, especially thank to, thanks to everybody who gave us super chats and bought memberships. And special thank you to our very own Angel for saving this channel. Yes. Thank our you. Angel. All right, guys. Angel. <laughs> All right, guys. Bye. Mwah.